Well, hello everyone and welcome back. So what's on tap for today? Well, we've got another reaction video to the debate between Anna Kasparian and Ben Shapiro. We're going to get to all that. The question in this debate is, can the media be trusted? And if so, which one? What are your opinions? We're going to get to that in the next few seconds, but before we do so, we just want to let you know that you're watching the Dr. Nasser Shake Show. I'm your guest host for today. My name is Dr. Nasser. Like, share, and follow us. Hit that notification bell. Subscribe to the channel. Let's get to part four of the debate between Anna and Ben. Um, we talked about the trust issue, and there's some yep. very interesting surveys out there on trust. Uh, Gallup did a survey. There's a drop across the board in trust in all institutions, except law enforcement, which is very interesting. Um, Congress, sorry for my friends there, is the lowest. Uh, media is down there almost as low as Congress. <laughs> Those that rank the highest were small business and the military. So this low media rank, is that fair or is that being manufactured as part of a culture war? Uh, oh, it's fair. Then. I mean, it's entirely fair. I mean, it, it's, I think that one of the things that we've seen for both good and bad, the, the, the fragmentation of media is a result of systemic distrust in the media, and that's existed for a very long time. I mean, that's nothing new. Uh, and I think that it's completely fair for people to look at the media. I know there are people on the left who think that the media is too right-wing. Right? Uh, obviously, we on the right think that, that the media is far too left-wing. Um, but I think that, that that sort of distrust in media sources is very often justified. I think that we're requiring more of people than we used to in the past, because once people have realized that there's an inherently political angle to how people cover the news, now we're asking them if you want a full, rounded diet, you actually have to choose it yourself. Right? You have to cultivate yourself to watch the Young Turks and then watch my show and decide who you agree with, and where there's sort of a common locus of fact, that's the fact and everything else is the opinion. That's asking a lot of viewers where we didn't used to ask very much of viewers at all, right? You just turn on the evening news and buy whatever Walter Cronkite is saying, whether it's true or not. Um, I, I think most Americans waking up to that is a good thing. Uh, the systemic lack of trust in media has some bad downstream effects sometimes because when there are no gatekeepers, there are no gatekeepers. So I like the fact that there are no gatekeepers because I think the, the gatekeepers were very often biased, but without gatekeepers, sometimes bad stuff gets through. Yeah, I mean, I think... Nicely put, concise, precise. You know, what Ben basically is saying is sort of the same thing that I believe in. I guess most of you out there probably believe in too. Um, basically is that, look, we're, when we're born, we're raised with certain values, certain morals, cultures, you know, those kind of things, all right? We all put them together, mix them around. It's a nice little recipe. And then we basically have our, you know, where we are fall on the, uh, on the spectrum, you know, conservative, liberal, you know, somewhere in the middle. And then we gravitate to what? To those things that we like. The thing that I stress all the time is I love to watch. I love to watch MSNBC and CNN and CNNBC and Fox, the Young Turks, uh, you know, shows that are like, you know, progressive, you know, on the left. I like to watch uh, other shows that we would say basically maybe have a little bit more of a conservative, you know, more on the right, like, you know, um, the Daily Wire, um, you know, uh, you know, the blaze, um, you know, obviously rush at the time, uh, any of those, you know, Mark Levin, um, you know, Sean, uh, you know, um, Laura Ingram, obviously. So we watch it and then, you know what, we basically, a lot of times we agree. Sometimes we don't agree with them on um, many times are when we're watching the shows that are from the left or a progressive standpoint. Okay. We just basically their opinions uh, their policies, we just take a look at it and say, there's just no way we can accept that. But that's up to us. And as Ben basically said, is that, you know what, we if you want that full rounded diet, you have the ability now to go and turn, tune things in or tune things out. Let's see what Anna has to say about this. that right now we're experiencing people existing in various filter bubbles. So uh, if you are, for instance, uh, consuming most of your news online, if you like a particular brand of programming, uh, if you, let's say, lean more conservative and you're watching mostly conservative news, algorithms offer up more and more conservative news. And so when you get a 
If you have preconceived notions and all of a sudden you're hearing or reading something that challenges those preconceived notions, you're going to have a negative reaction to it. And you see that playing out across the board. I'll give you an example. I mean, I have family members who are constantly consuming news online. Um, my mom's a good example, right? She's, uh, you'd be surprised she's my mom because she's on Facebook. She clicked on a link to, let's say, the Daily Wire, perfect example. Well, Facebook is going to be offering up more Daily Wire type content, and then all of a sudden when she's watching The Young Turks, she'll be like, well, you know, I read on Facebook or I read on The Daily Wire, whatever, uh, that X, Y, and Z happened, and you're wrong, right? Um, that conversation doesn't actually happen that often. But I'm giving you an example. I was hopeful example, there for a second. Right? And so, <laughs> so, look, there are all sorts of issues with the media, right? I mean, the, the media for the longest time completely ignored the very real frustrations that workers have been feeling in this country. I mean, the Federal Reserve released data indicating that nearly half of Americans can't even afford a $400 emergency. At the same time, you tune into CNN, CNBC, MSNBC. I mean, it doesn't matter across the board. And they're like, the economy is doing great. Uh, you know, we're seeing uh, record growth. And what they're specifically talking about is the stock market. But the stock market is disconnected from the reality that the majority of workers are experiencing. So I, I, I just have to stop this here right now. When she's talking about the stock market disconnected from the reality of most of the workers that are out there, I tend to disagree on this. Because first of all, many workers that are working for companies, they have 401k plans that are either being partially um, sub, not subsidized, but you know, uh, the workers, I mean, the, the corporation is paying into a part for their 401k retirement plan. I'm talking about those workers now that are working for a larger company that offers these plans to their employees. So they are, and there are millions of them that are involved in the stock market. And nowadays we've been hearing this so often that it is so easy that more and more people are getting to the stock market. These are the everyday people, average ordinary citizens, young people with the cryptocurrency, you know, getting on um, Robinhood and all these other platforms that literally, um, this, with this thing here, you get on here, you put the app on, any brokerage account that's out there, put your money inside there, boom, you're off to the races, okay, you start trading. And that's what they're doing. And then there are a lot of workers that are putting that, you know, now with many brokerage accounts are allowing you to buy fractional shares. So I think what Anna is, Anna is talking about is that it being completely, you know, uh, away from the workers and has nothing to do with it. I think that's absolutely, you know, I would counter that to say, I completely disagree with that. I think that that type of stuff leads to uh, people feeling, you know, distrustful toward the press. At the same time, they exist in these filter bubbles and have their preconceived notions. It's hard to challenge that. So there's a lot of different things happening at the same time. I don't blame people for not being so trusting of the media. One other thing that I'll note is that the incentives are always in the wrong place. The kind of stories that I want to talk about on The Young Turks and do talk about on The Young Turks get no attention. They don't do well in terms of the number of views. I want to talk about international news. I want to talk about what's happening in Brazil. I want to talk about what's happening in Ecuador. It'll get like maybe 40,000 views at most. You know what gets a lot of views? I don't know. Anna Kasparian destroys this person. Or here's the latest cat fight. Like, I hate it. It's garbage. It's garbage. Because it leads to people not trusting the press, but at the same time, the profits are there. The money is there. And I think you see that play out across the board, whether you're talking about cable news or online media. Uh, yeah, and at the, at the dinner table, we're having an interesting conversation. So just to end this, I think this part uh, in part four here, um, I think basically it was a draw. I think they both made their points uh, in terms of um, what they felt like. It seems that Anna always likes to go right back to the workers, which can be appreciated. I mean, you know, she's got her, you know, opinions on that. But sometimes I think it's, she's so, you know, so much with the workers that she fails to realize that without the people that started the businesses and put in the capital, took the risk, took the loans to start the business so that the workers could be there. 
I mean, where would the workers be? And then you could take the corollary that where would the business be without the workers, you know, which came first, the chicken or the egg or whatever. But essentially in in, in this uh, in this part here, I, I think it was basically, you know, a tie. I think they both got their parts across. As I said, be, mentioned before, I would have just, um, if it came back to me and they allowed, you know, for additional uh, time, I would have probably... Uh, raise a question in terms of uh, to Anna about the stock market, you know, not being directly tied to uh, to the workers um, that, you know, she basically said that, you know, they really don't care. That has nothing to do with them at all. Uh, the other thing is, you know, but listen, um, I love to watch the Young Turks. I like to see uh, the opinions, you know, that Anna puts forth. She's bright. Um, she's savvy. Um She's one of the few <laughs> liberal women out there, okay, <laughs> that uh, not only has some brains, but is, uh, you know, beautiful as well. So, listen, but policy-wise, I would say 90% of the time, we're pro I, I would say 90% of the time with the Young Turks, with Anna, diametrically opposed. And I'm sure there's probably somewhere 5 to 10% of agreement that we can come on. Anyways, um... Let's go and see if there's anything further as they discuss uh, the rebuttals. Let's take a look. It's clearly a generational thing. My generation grew up watching Walter Cronkite and uh, Huntley and Brinkley and all, and all these folks. And one of the things that I saw in your bio was that you got interested in this field because of Barbara Walters. So. What happens now to the Barbara Walters? I mean, where does news reporting go? Are we gonna, will the nightly news be a thing of the past? And are we simply gonna continue to retreat to those mediums that, that demonstrate that we know everything already? Where's, where's this gonna go now? Well, let me just note, I, I loved Barbara Walters on ABC's 2020. <laughs> so I remember um, as a kid, you know, like getting super excited after TGIF was over because uh, ABC's 2020 would be on. And I, I was like fascinated by the fact that this woman was getting paid to talk to these incredibly interesting people from around the world. And I was just fascinated by the conversations. That's how I got interested in journalism and the media. But I just feel like the type of conversations that she had or just news about world events, they don't seem to attract the kind of attention that they used to. And it might be because of an oversaturated market. It might be because conflict tends to sell. Um, manufactured conflicts tend to sell. Um, but it's, I wish we can get back to a place where journalism still really existed, where there was like ethical standards that were, you know, that reporters abided by, anchors abided by. I wish there was a clear distinction between opinion and actual hard news journalism. You know, this is what I talk about with my journalism students whenever I have the time to teach. Uh, I always tell them, I'm like, look, there's a difference between what I do, which is analysis, opinion, and what you should be doing as an investigative journalist, for instance, you know, going out there and actually gathering the news, talking to both sides, not equating both sides and acting as if, you know, you're completely neutral, um, but making sure that you gather the facts on the ground and report them as they are. It's really hard to find that these days. There's still great journalism taking place. Uh, I wouldn't be able to do my analysis or my job without that great journalism taking place. Uh, but these are the people who are oftentimes not paid well, ignored, um, and don't get any of the benefits that someone might in the media if you engage in the conflict nonsense. Can we go back, Ben, and separate the fact? So basically, I agree here with, uh, with, with what Anna is saying, absolutely. Um, you know, she said one of her idols at the time, you know, Barbara Walters, as she was growing up watching her, wanted to be like her, you know, just absolutely... Um, you know, like she said, just amazed that here's this lady talking to people, you know, making money and talking to these uh, great figures in history and whatever. But the thing that we go back to is that, you know, clicks sell. Conflict sells. I mean, even for our channel, if you take a look at the number of views, when you start just doing a piece on, like I did, we had a video about DeSantis. And, um, you know, what he basically was doing in terms of breaking up, um, you know, Disney's, I guess, kingdom down in Florida. I thought that was a great piece. Interesting. Talks about what's happening with Disney, what's happening with Ron DeSantis, 
how they're you know curtailing the power, taking the power away from Disney, bringing it back to the people. Eh, you know what? People they click on it, they look at it, whatever. Then you do a little piece, then you do a piece on here. You know, Anna versus Ben debate part two or three, and you get you know hundreds or thousands of views on there. You know, and you're like, okay, because. They, there's a, obviously there's some more interest in this than there is, you know, in that story. So that's just the way it goes, you know. Sensationalism has always sold. There's nothing new about that. So as I said before, let's see what Ben has to talk about in his sort of rebuttal to this. Based from the opinion now, or is it going to be conflated for the foreseeable future? I mean, I think the truth is that that was a relatively modern construct. I mean, if you go back to the foundations of the Republic, the people who were reporting were also doing opinion, and that was true all the way through the beginning of the 20th century. It was really only with Walter Lippmann in the 1920s that you start talking about objective standards in journalism. And there's a difference between an objective standard that you apply to how a story is reported and being an objective reporter, meaning you have no politics at all. And I think, frankly, if you want to reinstall some sort of institutional trust, it would be good for reporters to say, here's who I voted for, and then here are also the facts that I am reporting on, because otherwise it ends up being a gotcha, right? I see how you're reporting that. I see what you're doing. I know right. what you really think about this story. Uh, so that, that's a major issue. I think the other big issue, obviously, I mentioned gatekeepers before. Uh, I'm very wary of the reinstallation of institutional gatekeepers, because if you want to talk about market incentives, the big players have all the incentives to ensure that they are the ones who maintain their access via the gates. Uh, and this is one of my great fears with some sites that we've been very successful with, like Facebook, is that reestablishing the idea that there are quote unquote trusted news sources and those all coincidentally are legacy media sources yep. uh, means <laughs> that everybody who's not a legacy media source, somebody who started up a company in the last 10 years, right? We opened in our doors in 2015. We're not legacy media. And so we don't have that legacy. So now you're shutting out all the players who are actually entering the market. So you actually mentioned, again, just a little bit of a shift because you got my attention earlier. You're both born and raised in California. So basically, again, you know, Ben just uh, laid it out in terms of, you know, what he thought that legacy media, if they're going to be the gatekeepers, if they're going to be the ones that decide, you know, who gets to be put under the, um, you know, the label of legacy, well, they're the ones that are already in control. They're the ones that are already in control of the power, already in control of who gets in, who gets out. You know, they're the ones that, uh, you know, are the major power players right now and, you know, People like get, just getting on YouTube right now, starting off a YouTube channel, starting off the Daily Wire, as Ben was saying, um, getting, you know, trying to, you know, get your feet solid, okay, in the journalistic world. Well, where are they going to be? So, as you said, distrustful of the, leg you know, uh, of the legacy media is absolutely, you know, something that all of us uh, want to be, uh, you know, aware of, regardless of whether, like I said, it's, you know, Fox or CNBC or CNN or MSNBC. Um, we need to have it open and wide for everybody and then let people decide where they're going to put their dollars to, where they're going to put their time invested in viewing, where they're going to, you know, where they're going to gravitate to. Let the people decide. Anyways, we appreciate you taking the time to watch this uh, debate part four between Anna Kasparian and uh, Ben Shapiro. Um, you've been watching the Dr. Nasser Shake Show. I've been your guest host. My name is Dr. Nasser. If you haven't done so, subscribe to the channel, like, share, and follow us. Hit that notification bell. Comment below. Let me know what you think. I thought it was a draw in part four, and I'll leave you with my final thought, which is when you're right, you're right, and when you're left, you're wrong. We'll see you again next time, folks. Take care and stay safe.